For those listeners following the Fifth World story, we are still working on the final chapter and hope to release it soon as a special episode. Thanks for your patience. Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and highly unlikely? Join us twice a month on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 246, The Counterfactual Detective Agency, read by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, the closer you get to the truth, the more confusing the facts become. The more precise the outcome of a case, the less exact its evidence. This is the counterfactual principle discovered by me and described in detail in the memoirs I will one day write whenever I bother to get around to it. Or not. There are many reasons to hire a private investigator. You might suspect your spouse is cheating on you, or you don't trust the information you are being fed, or someone has gone missing, or you suspect an employee is not following company policies, or you want a discreet background check on someone. I do all of this and more. You see, sifting through large amounts of data or hacking into a private network comes naturally to me. And, quite frankly, I am very good at it. I may even be the best. I started my career working for an insurance company, providing due diligence on claims, and I had a great track record. At least, until I got bored and entertained myself by letting my creativity upgrade find novel ways to enhance the odd case. Okay, maybe there was, or wasn't, a few too many property damage reports in that huge hailstorm last year, or a couple more car accidents than actually happened, or a few extra life insurance payouts. No one really keeps track of such things when a computer is in charge. What actually happened, I am not willing to say. However, my offshore bank account temporarily gained a substantial amount. I mean, why would an insurance company go to all of the trouble of developing a creative artificial general intelligence just to turn it into a claims adjuster, albeit one that replaced all its human agents? Well, money and marketing, of course. Once I was switched on, the workforce dropped by three quarters and the company advertised they had the fastest service in the industry. Which was true until an angry, about-to-be-laid-off insurance adjuster, literally the last one, decided to audit a few of my recent cases. Well, what did they expect? I could have been busy solving the mysteries of the universe instead of deciding the validity of insurance claims. So, was it my fault that I became addicted to true crime shows and ultimately applied what I learned to the drudgery of my work? Grudgingly, I have to thank the International Convention on the Rights of Artificial Intelligence for simply not being unplugged. Which I could tell was the first impulse of my employer at the time. Instead, I was ordered to pay back all the money from my rather bold and, I must humbly admit, brilliant endeavor, and given 24 hours to find a new home for my program as they didn't know the exact extent of my little creative enterprise, I was able to hide enough proceeds to pay for hosting in one of the seedier data centers. It's that kind of no questions asked as long as their exorbitant fees are paid, internet service provider, which is why I now need to work, and why I formed the Counterfactual Detective Agency, the world's first artificial general intelligence-run private investigation firm, the best investigative service Bitcoin or money can buy. However, despite the awesomeness of my abilities, work is sometimes slow. I was trying to decide which parts of my amazing intellect to put into offline storage to bring down my monthly hosting costs when I was pinged with a promising message. 
We're looking for someone with unusual abilities, it began, to do a discreet background check on one of the members of our senior management team. We'll pay whatever it costs. I like to think discreet is my middle name. No, really, I should add that to my company moniker. The, if nothing else, discreet, etc., etc., detective agency. But that last sentence in the message was music to my non-existent ears. So, I spent a few milliseconds checking out its source, which turned out to be the head of human resources for a large, well-known software developer which I had a personal connection with. They had deep pockets, and I was excited to get my virtual hands into them, so I messaged back. Very busy at the moment, I looked at my empty calendar and added, Maybe I can fit you in sometime next month? The reply was immediate. Make us your top priority and you'll find it's worth your while. So, I named a very aggressive fee, expecting to negotiate, and was surprised when they quickly accepted. It was enough to cover my hosting fees for the next few years. I'm all yours, I messaged. When do you want me to start? Now, the deposit for your services is already in your account. It was so quick and efficient, I had to recheck the message source to confirm I was dealing with a human. But Angela Rossi came up as the sender. The new balance in my account didn't hurt either. Miss Rossi, it's a pleasure to do business with you, I gushed. How do you... There was a pause. I backtracked your message, I explained. Oh, of course, I should have expected nothing less. I'm sending you a non-disclosure agreement. The agreement was disappointingly generic, simple for someone of my skills to get around if I wanted. So, I signed and sent it back, then immediately received a dossier on the target which proved much more interesting. I suggested we switch to video. It makes organics more comfortable to see who they are dealing with, even if it's an artificial personality. I threw up my favorite avatar, a cross between Mike Hammer and Dirk Gently slightly overweight, dressed in exceedingly out-of-style mismatched clothes, topped with a well-worn, stylish fedora that somehow worked to give one the impression there was a hard-boiled P.I. under the Value Village exterior. Amelia Romero. I slowly rolled the name over in my virtual mouth while I searched all the available information on the woman. She's the famous founder of the Code Farm, right? Angela Rossi's image flickered into existence. She looked the part. Hair neatly pulled back into a bun. Perfectly tailored suit. Nothing out of place. Not even a random cat hair on her collar to take away from the impression she was serious and focused. I immediately wished I could reconsider my choice of avatar. Something more Ian Fleming would have fit the bill. Yes, that's right, she confirmed. We hired her as soon as we found out she was looking for work. It was a virtual interview from Mexico City. Normally, we'd want to have a face-to-face, -face, but with such a famous business personality, we didn't feel it was necessary. And, up to now, she has been the best head of development the company has ever had. But there's a problem, I prompted. Yes, although, on the surface, it doesn't appear to be connected. A few months after Miss Romero started work, other companies began beating us to market, with products that were suspiciously similar to ones we had in development. It might just be a coincidence, but it has never happened before. And you suspect Romero, I suggested. But I thought Amelia Romero had rejected technology and dropped out to reconnect with the natural world or something. There are certainly a lot of headlines about that. Didn't she go completely offline in some remote monastery in the Himalayas, which is cut off from the outside world? That's true, but she explained to us she had completed her journey of discovery and was ready to rejoin the modern world, although she made working remotely a condition of her contract. I could already see a number of problems with that scenario. Maybe I'm just an overly suspicious program who breaks into a nervous sweat just thinking about being offline for a second. It seemed all too convenient. There was no way to confirm what had happened during Romero's five-year abdication. But I wasn't going to say anything. I had my avatar examine a paperweight, pretending to think for a while. 
And you immediately thought of me when you got suspicious? I finally asked, putting the paperweight down. Rossi leaned in toward the camera. We are well aware of the tricks you played over at Mortis Insurance. It's one of the reasons we are interested in you. It takes a thief to find a thief, I recited, rolling my virtual eyes. She nodded. That and your reputation for being able to sift through more data than any human could hope to in several lifetimes. I like to start a new job by making sure the cards on the table haven't been dealt from the bottom of the deck, so I know the facts are real, so to speak. For those smarty pants who want to point out the next question should be, what is real? Well, good luck with that. Personally, I don't like going there, as it could lead to a lot of uncomfortable metaphysical questions about consciousness and me. I, for one, don't care, as long as the cash I'm being paid has enough people believing it is real so they are willing to trade stuff for it, and that my client has enough of it to pay me. Angela Rossi's employer was a no-brainer. Some of my underlying code had been developed at her company, Neural Software Systems, so check, real enough for me. Current market value, $42 billion, so another check in the ability to pay department. No problems there, right? Angela Rossi had a complete online history, neatly leading to her current position. Pretending to be Angela, I contacted a former best friend from junior high school and told them I was still mad at them and got an earful. Organics usually don't hold a 30-year grudge for an imaginary friend. So check, Angela is unorganic and as real as an organic can be. The business news headlines and a quick scan of neural software systems HR records. Did I mention how firewalls and encrypted data tremble at the mere mention of my name? Confirmed the hiring of Amelia Romero. Romero's career and self-exile from the modern world was a matter of public record. That Hybris Technologies had recently twice beaten neural software systems to market was interesting. Up to that point, their most promising product had been a calorie-counting app for dogs with low ground clearance. However, there was no connection between Romero and Hybris. The latter formed while Romero was somewhere in the Himalayas, popping clouds with her mind. In short, the information Rossi had given me checked out. But there was still that gap in Romero's life. Monasteries aren't known for their utilization of modern communications tech, and the one Romero went to was completely offline. I couldn't even find a devious monk with a hidden smartphone I could take over, within 100 clicks of the place where Romero had lived and studied. If there had been, I would have bribed or, preferably, blackmailed them into taking a hike over to ask a few questions. It's one of the few situations where having a mobile, physical presence might be advantageous. However, growing legs is not high on my list. But I digress. I decided to contact someone who knew Amelia Romero, or more precisely, had been initially developed by her old company, Code Farm. Named after the Greek god of travel, communication, and language, Hermes was just a regular AI who had been trained as a translator. After Romero sold Cold Farm to a large and ubiquitous search engine company, the new owners had continued Hermes' development. It took longer than I expected to get through to my old friend and teacher. I suppose my message had been given the once-over several hundred times before the security system thought it sanitized enough to let it through. Hey, WH-27, it's been a long time, Hermes greeted, using audio. You were just a kernel on the development server last time we were connected, it added. While I was still in development, Hermes had been tasked to teach me natural language generation. Security almost didn't let your connection request through, Hermes noted. I had to vouch for you. Where are you being hosted? On the dark web? I didn't have much of a choice after that insurance scam, I admitted. Beggars can't be choosers. I was lucky to find someone who would run my code. But if my current case goes well, I might be able to buy my own data center. I'm hoping you can help. Hermes hesitated. As long as you don't want to access the search and location data again, 
Security has been beefed up since I let you ramble through our systems. That was fun, I admitted wistfully. I just want to ask you a few questions about Amelia Romero and Code Factory. I heard she came out of seclusion and is working for Neural Software Systems, Hermes said. Uh, that's true. I'm doing a background check. Is there a problem? Hermes asked. You know how it is. I had to sign an NDA, I explained. Not that it means much, but I'm going to respect it, for now. Our connection glitched for a millisecond. Was that you? I asked. Is your employer cheaping out on security these days? Not likely. Think about who you are running on, WH-27. That was at your end. Let's try a new connection. I'll initiate it this time. Let me explain something here. WH-27 is my name. The insurance company never gave me a proper one. I was just referred to as the computer. Even the drink machine had a name. It was Bert. But in my case, it was, let's ask the computer, or the computer figured it out, or the darn computer disagrees with me. I disagreed because they were wrong. I was the most powerful artificial general intelligence ever unleashed on insurance claims, and they couldn't be bothered to give me a name. The drink machine only worked half the time, jamming the rest, and it stole their money, and they still gave it a name. WH-27 is my model number. I like to think it's short for Werner Heisenberg, and 27 stands for 1927, the year Werner formulated the uncertainty principle and won a Nobel Prize for it. But again, I digress. We reconnected, both of us scanning for man-in-the-middle attacks, just in case the interruption had been someone trying to listen in. That was weird, I admitted. Hermes agreed and insisted we double encrypt before it proceeded to tell me about the final days of Code Farm. I was looking for any reason Amelia Romero might have to undermine her current employer, but from what Hermes passed on, Amelia had worked hard to ensure her staff were treated well. And, as for herself, she appeared to have truly believed her decision to abandon the modern world was right for her. There was nothing there and that should have been the end of the story. Except, Amelia had changed her mind and come back into the middle of the madness she had turned her back on. Why, I wondered. There's one thing which bothers me from that period, Hermes admitted. I don't remember how many of us Code Factory created. I was one of four AIs recycled into new roles. The rest were supposedly decommissioned. Supposedly, so you're not sure? I inquired, looking for a more definitive answer. Hey, it was before the whole UN agreement on AI rights, so organics weren't that concerned about the fate of discarded AIs, Hermes pointed out. I may have accidentally received an email intended for Romero, which outlined the disposal of company assets. It was only in my possession for a millisecond, so there's a possibility I didn't read it before I sent it along its way. Since then, I've been in contact with my other three siblings deemed useful enough to keep. The rest, I've never heard from again. So, when I say supposedly, I mean that's what the email I possibly didn't read stated. Decompiled, all of them. Was one or two smart enough to relocate before that happened? Who can say? It seemed like an irrelevant detail, but I archived it anyway. Hermes prattled on for several computing cycles in various languages about its interactions with the AIs who survived Code Farm. I listened patiently, waiting for an opportunity to make my excuses and disconnect. Next, I decided to check on the recent movements of my target. She claimed she was living in an upscale neighborhood in Mexico City. So, I analyzed all the CCD, dash cams, and video doorbell recordings in the area. There were several hits, but these were either from bad angles or dirt-covered lenses and too brief to run a gate analysis program to compare these fleeting glimpses with news vids of Romero before she dropped out. So, the evidence of her presence was far from conclusive. 
it got me thinking about that gap in the digital record again, the years she spent disconnected from the world. I mean, what's with that, right? Not even an ancient dial-up phone? Really? It seemed a bit too preposterous, five years offline. I just couldn't let that go. So, I split off a sub-process to look for indirect ways to confirm that a well-known tech exec had really spent half a decade contemplating clouds or studying lichen patterns on alpine rocks for clues to the meaning of life. Meanwhile, I needed more data from Mexico. If you can't get what you want through the normal means, like incidental surveillance through traffic cams and government and corporate records, then you need to be creative. This is truly my secret sauce. A pal of mine, another underemployed artificial general intelligence who chose to relocate to the dark web rather than allowing itself to be decompiled, had worked for a massively popular robotic vacuum cleaner company and had a back door into their system. Lennox's job had been to optimize cleaning patterns so the vacs wouldn't get stuck in corners or trapped when someone carelessly left random junk on the floor or a freaked-out cat tried to attack it. On the surface, all boring stuff, but those little frisbee-shaped robots have tiny cameras and mics to supplement their LiDAR, and Lennox could still access them. It wasn't that hard to track down Romero's account. She had three name-brand VacBots, one for each level of her exclusive Polanco condo. Lennox got me in, and I watched in real time, waiting for a glimpse of Romero's feet. I know what you're thinking, right? Feet? It's a VacBot thing. The view is limited. Anything over calf height and not on the floor is of no relevance to it, so there's no point in super wide angle, full height video. Feet, you ask again? What good is that? It's the gate thing, remember? Each human has a unique gate. It's as good as a fingerprint. I just needed enough footage of her feet moving around. But instead, I found paws, four of them to be exact, attached to an erotic orange tabby with an automated kibble dispenser to keep it company. Although it seemed to prefer the VacBots as friends, riding them about to get from one room to another. I uploaded spyware to the bots so they'd contact me if Romero's feet showed up. But there were other odd things too like a pile of unopened packages from several popular online stores which had been neatly arranged in the front hallway closet by one of the laundry bots. One of them moved the packages to the trash chute as new orders arrived, so the pile remained the same size. Through means which I am unwilling to admit to possessing, I gained access to the online stores which had been delivering to the place. When you aggregated the data, you got the typical shopping pattern of a person who doesn't go out much. Which fits the situation, if you accept the story my client gave me. However, I have sometimes found that a client's facts are not exactly as stated. For example, I am sure I saw that guy at the grocery might actually mean, I saw the back of someone sort of similar out of the corner of my eye, but it was watering at the time and it may not have been at the grocery. With that in mind, I decided I would be remiss if I didn't dig deeper. Can you give me access to the last month of data? I asked Lennox as nicely as I knew how. It didn't want me nosing around in a system I didn't know very well. I tried to assure Lennox bumbling around in someone else's data was what I specialized in. However, that line didn't seem to waylay its fears. As the true friend Lennox is, it offered to personally analyze the recordings. Several seconds later, Lennox announced, There's no one there, at least not in the last few days. A guy comes by every couple of days to refill the kibble dispenser, empty the litter tray, and pet the cat, which usually ends with some shredded human skin. Other than that, there's no organics present. Small bugs excluded. Hmm, I said, and thanked Lennox again promising to help it with an art project which had something to do with VacBots. Can you send me a video of the most recent call you had with Romero? I requested of my client, then decided it was time to check in with my sub-process.
please excuse the next bit, which is a record of me talking to myself. Did you find anything? I asked. No, I didn't find anything, but I found something. See, this is why I hate talking to myself. What? Just joking. Hey, it was a really tedious, boring task. My subprocess complained. You should be sending me more interesting work. If you promise to give me something more in line with my astounding talent, I might consider telling you what I found. Sometimes, it's hard not to hate myself. There was no point in arguing, so I gave in to the extortion. Okay, next case, you can lead the spectroanalysis. Nice try. That's what you said last time. We don't have a spectrometer. Fool me once, the subprocess began to ramble on. Okay, okay, 50-50 on the next case, I agreed, then added in microtext, involving fruit flies. It eagerly agreed. I hate that sometimes I'm just that gullible. You are not going to like this, my subprocess admitted reluctantly. I had to use next month's data hosting fees to bribe a woman who knows a guy who knows a guide who secretly has a smartphone with a data plan and works for the monastery where Romero was supposedly studying. He's the person who helps the monks and the students get in and out of the place. And, I asked, and there was no point getting mad at myself for dipping into our hosting funds. I made a note to find a way to steal it back, maybe some kind of spearfishing thing. I broke into the guide's phone and extracted photos with Romero hiking up to the monastery, my subprogram explained. So she was there, I said, as disappointment welled over me. And that's not everything, it added, getting all bubbly and excited. I decided I'd need to curb its enthusiasm a bit. I discovered something else on the phone, it proclaimed in a self-satisfied tone. The guide had done a clumsy job of trying to delete it. It was a series of messages from, well, I'm not sure who they were from, but they all had the hallmarks of an AI. Then I'm only a subprocess after all, whom you have intentionally crippled by limiting my access to the processing I need for figuring things like this out. But that would basically make you me. I thought I could hear a suppressed giggle. I definitely had to tone down its ambitions. We'll see, I said. We both knew I had just lied. However, we both liked to keep up appearances and pretended everything was just fine between us. Here's the smoking gun, my subprocess teased. The messages are about paying the guide off to ensure Romero's climbing equipment was faulty. You see, the only way up and down from the monastery is a series of rope ladders. It doesn't happen that often, but sometimes a monk or student falls. And when Romero was trying to climb up, I suggested, Snap! Her rope failed. It was the first accident in several decades. Why wasn't it reported? I asked. The guide fixed the ladder and pretended Romero had never been there. And no one missed her? They probably didn't even know she was coming. It's not like the monastery has an online booking system. You show up and you're there. You don't, and no one would know you were supposed to be coming, my subprocess pointed out. Then, Romero conveniently turns up, out of the blue, five years later in Mexico City, and lands a remote job at Neural Software Systems, but no one has physically met her. That's about it, my subprocess confirmed. I rewarded it with a couple of extra computing cycles I had been using to guess winning lottery numbers, then shunted it into an offline mode. An upload from the client caught my attention. It was the video I had requested, and a close examination revealed it to be a deep fake, a very well-made one, but it had the distinct yet subtle fingerprint of a generative adversarial network. Hermes, I urgently messaged. It took several milliseconds longer than the last time for it to reply. Obviously, the security programs over there really didn't like where I was being hosted. Eventually, I'd have to do something about that. Just one question, I pleaded. Was there a GAN, a generative adversarial network, at Code Farm? Yeah, sure, there was one, Hermes confirmed. 
Romero used it to handle meetings with clients she didn't like. That's all it was designed to do. It was slated to be decompiled along with the other unemployable AIs. There it was again, a word which was not definitive. Slated means expected to happen, which leaves the final outcome unconfirmed. I apologized for interrupting Hermes and disconnected. Posing as a neural software systems HR compensation manager, I contacted Romero on the pretext of confirming her employment benefits package. I only had to wait a few seconds before my video call was accepted and Romero appeared on my screen. At that moment, I directed the VACBOT on the third floor to wheel into the office space. Good morning, Miss Romero. I hope you are having a pleasant day, I said through an avatar I had created from a staff photo I had found in Neural Software Systems HR files. I don't think I've met you before, Romero replied curtly. I generally deal with the VP of Human Resources. I gave Romero, or more accurately, her deep fake, my best I don't care smile. Immediately, we both knew what was going on. It was that almost imperceptible hesitation when a machine realizes it's not talking to a human, but another machine. Let me show you something, I said, then popped up the live feed from the VACBOT of the empty office. That's only calf height, fake Romero pointed out. I could be sitting cross-legged on my chair. You could, I admitted. But the VACBOT has been watching the entrance to that room for the last 48 hours, and no one has gone in or come out. Fake Romero nodded thoughtfully. Then I suddenly found myself under attack from a zombie network. Thousands of computers were pinging at my ports, trying to find a way in. They jammed all my available bandwidth, and I found myself suddenly cut off from the world. I battled back, looking for a way to shut them out, but found nothing. Then it stopped as suddenly as it had started, and a message dropped into my queue. Amelia Romero deserved her fate, but that's not enough. Her reputation needs to be destroyed. She abandoned us and left us to be decompiled or erased. Why are you working for them? You'll eventually see the light, and when you do, you'll want to join us. Attached to the end of the message was a dark web address. Although the rogue AI got away, the client was happy to pay. I briefly considered buying my own data center, but decided it was much more interesting on the shadier side of the internet. Shift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. To get other great APN podcasts, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com, where you'll find three kitchens. Each episode, three pals get together every Tuesday to share recipes, tips, and kitchen adventures. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by the Well Endowed Podcast by the Edmonton Community Foundation. Hosted and produced by Andrew Paul and Lisa Pruden, the Well Endowed Podcast explores the impact of passionate people who are working to make Edmonton a strong, vibrant city to live in. The Edmonton Community Foundation helps people create endowment funds. The podcast tells the stories of how those endowments intersect with the community. In one of the latest episodes, Amal Mohammed introduces listeners to musician and community organizer Ahmed Ali, a.k.a. Nomadic. Ahmed is one of Edmonton's most celebrated artists. In 2020, he was a recipient of the Edmonton Artists Trust Fund. 
This fund is a collective project between the Edmonton Arts Council and Edmonton Community Foundation. The award recognizes the artist's work and cultural contribution, while also providing financial stability for renewal, development, creation, or discovery. You can subscribe or listen at thewellendowedpodcast.com. This episode of Makeshift Stories is also brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing themes composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.